Today's app we're going to be learning is Ketubot Mem Gimel. Today's app is sponsored by Emily Croft on behalf of her uncle Paul's Yurit site. And today's app is also sponsored by Natalie Taylor, in memory of Sam Fink's Akronol Vacha, whose Shloshim is today. A warm and generous man, adored by his family and friends, Yehi Zichro Baruch. Okay, we're now going to start at the, uh, we'll go back a little bit to Mem Bet Amubet at the bottom. We were talking about Rabbi Shimon's approach, that if you remember, Vichy Chesh Ba'amito, and the details there come to exclude any case that started with Knesset, you're not going to have a Korban Shvua, you're not going to bring a sacrifice if you swore falsely, if you denied it, swore falsely, and then admitted that you had lied. So that won't apply to any case of Knas, like the rape case. And even though the rape case, remember, Right, the, so part of the issue was that when it said in the Mishnah, Anastu Pitita Piti, and he says, Lo Anastu Pititi, Rabbi Shimon says, he exempts because Enom Shalem Knasa Piatzmo. Now that's not really the reason why Rabbi, Yeshua, why Rabbi Shimon exempts. So the Gemara had ended up saying, well, Rabbi Shimon, there is really, t- I really think Rabbi Shimon says, we learned it from Bechichesh, that that excludes the case. But what I was saying is, according to the rabbis, you should say, and that's again because he didn't stand, he wasn't, it was all by his own admission, and there's no knas by your own admission, so of course you're not going to have to pay or, uh, bring a korban shvua. So Rabbi Shimon says, you should at least admit to me, okay, I know you don't think that, kna- you think knas becomes mamon, but that's only before, that's only after the court convicts, but agree with me at least, that in a case where there was no court, and the court didn't convict him, that when they go to demand the money here, it's knas, and modeba knas patur, and he admitted. So there shouldn't be any payment at all. He shouldn't have to bring a, a sacrifice either, a korban shvua. So what's the reason for the rabbis? Well, the rabbis have a very simple response. Rabbanan Savre, we're now starting at the top of our daf. Ki katava boshet katava. When we're talking about you rape my daughter, you seduce my daughter, the issue here is not the knas, it's the boshet and pagam payments, which are monetary payments for the degradation and humiliation that he caused her. So now the question is, but my commitment, what's the root of their machlok? And what's very interesting here is that there's an assumption. And the Ritva explains it very nicely. They say, when someone's coming forward and someone says, you rape my daughter, you seduce my daughter, and he's trying to make a claim to get money out of the guy, he's not going to come for all the money. He's not going to come for onus and the boshet and pagam. He's going to try to get you know, it's, you're, you're, you have a better tactic if you don't try to get too much. So the question is, which one is he going for? Which one is more likely he's going to try to get? The knas or the boshet and the pagam? And that's the debate between Rabbi Shimon and the rabbis. The rabbis say it's boshet and pagam, and Rabbi Shimon says it's the knas. Why? So that's what we're going to see right now. They might come and forget, what's the root of their disagreement? I'm a papa, Rabbi Shimon, savar lo shavik inish midi de kitz, betapa midi de lo kitz. Boshet and Pagam is something that changes based on the situation. It's it's very it's very hard to gauge, right? When you go to court and you want to get an amount, you want to get something that has a set amount. The amount for Knas is determined by the Torah. 50 shekels, 200 zuz, it's a nice amount also. You'd rather go for something that's a definitive amount rather than something that depends on the situation and you don't really know how much the court's going to award you. Rabbanan sabre, lo shafik inish midi dechi mode be lo miftar. Etava midi dechi mode be miftar. He's not going to, skip the Gvoshet and Begam and go for the Knas because the Boshet and Begam, even if the person if the person confesses, he still has to pay the Boshet and Begam. But if he confesses to the Knas, right, confesses that he raped her and all you're demanding is Knas, he's actually going to be exempt. So come the rabbis and say, of course you're not going to ask for Knas. That's something right now. The father has no proof. If he had proof, he wouldn't have to go to the guy and say, you raped my daughter. He would go bring witnesses that said you raped my daughter. So he doesn't have proof anyway. And if the person confesses, then in the end, there's no witnesses. In the end, he's not going to pay the knas. So of course, the rabbis think he's not coming for the knas. He's coming for the boshet and pagam. And then again, if it's boshet and pagam, then it's mamon. If it's mamon, then it's korban shvua. Rabbi Shimon says, no, 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 it's knas. And there's no korban shvua by knas. And that resolves the issue. And that explains the debate. Now we're going to move on to a different topic. And it's going to connect to the last line in our mission. Rabbi Avina asks Rav Shesh, Bat hanizonet minachim, maseya deha lemi. Let's go with some background. When um, when a person writes a ketubah to a woman, there's a commitment to the woman and in the event of death or divorce. And also the daughters are promised that they will get food as well. So when the father dies, the daughters, remember, don't inherit. The sons inherit, but the daughters get money from the father, so from the estate. 
Okay, they get money for, for sustenance. They don't get an inheritance, they just get fed. Okay, we'll talk soon about what if there's not enough money to feed both them and the sons and all that. But right now, we have a situation where she's getting funded by the brothers, okay, by their by the estate of the father that's now in the hands of the brothers. So who does her salary go to? Do we say, is, are they just basically taking the place of the father? Just like her masayadayim went to her father. Likewise here, her masayadayim go to the brothers. Or maybe it's not really the same situation. It's, it's obvious that her masayadayim go, go to the father. But it's not obvious to the brothers take his place. Or do we say, When the father was alive, she was getting paid directly from the father. She was getting her sustenance from them. And therefore, she was giving him his salary, her salary. But here, she's not actually getting from the brother's money. She's getting from the estate of the father. So it's not really directly from them. So maybe they don't get her ma'aseya there. To which we're going to see throughout the sugya that's going to take up until the next Mishnah on the next uh, on the second side of today's page is going to be this big debate between Rav Sheshet and we're going to see some others on the other side. So Amrle, Rav Sheshit answers, and he says to Rabbi Avina, he says, Tani Tua, let's learn it from here. There's a Mishnah at the end of, later in the Ketubo, which says, The widow, we can assume the widow is like the daughter. The widow also gets supported, okay? Until the widow demands her Ketuba, she gets food, sustenance. She gets from the money of the or- orphans. Uma shalahem, and her salary goes to them. If she works, any money she makes goes to them. To which the Gemara says, what are you talking about? This isn't similar at all. Midame. These aren't similar. Almanato. It's a fascinating line. Lo nichale baharvacha. The husband, when he before he died, okay, if this was, we're assuming that whatever is stipulated in the Ketub and whatever underri- unwritten rules are in there have to do with what the husband was interested in. Well, the husband, when the wife, when he dies, he wants to make sure that his wife is supported. She has food. But he doesn't need her to be wealthy and have extra money. Okay? He just wants her to have enough money to live on. But Bito, that's what it means. He doesn't need her to have extra money. But Bito, but when it comes to his daughter, he wants her to have extra money. He doesn't want her just to be fed. He wants her to have money. Why? Okay, what's the main reason? Well, so she can get a good shidduch. She has money for her dowry. It's always the concern of fathers for their daughters that they have a dowry, right, in those times. So, therefore, he'll want the daughter to keep her salary, have the brothers support him from her from the estate. But in addition, she gets to keep the salary she makes. So you can't compare it to there. Okay? And therefore, I don't agree with you that we can learn it from there. To which the Gemara asks, wait a minute. You're trying to say that the daughter's in a better position than the widow? Because this is a very big line, a short line that has a lot to be said. So what does this mean? This is an analogy. The widow to the daughter is like the daughter to the sons when it comes to not enough money in the estate. What does that mean? Let's say there's not enough money to feed the daughter and the brothers. So what do they do? They don't want the girls walking door to door trying to get money. So they give the money to the daughters to feed them. And the brothers have to knock on people's doors and take charity. So now compare widow is to daughter as daughter is to son. Then, so so since in the daughter to the brothers, she gets the money. So same thing here, the comparison. If it's a, a choice between the widow, there's not enough money to feed the widow and the daughter, forget about the sons, they for sure don't get. Widow versus daughter, who's going to get? The widow's going to get the food and the daughter's going to have to go knocking on doors. So there you see the widow is in a better state. She gets more money than the daughter. To which the Gemara says, again, you're comparing things that aren't worth, compa- that aren't a fair comparison. Fascinating line again about what people what their thought process is, what the man wishes for his daughter and his widow. It's very humiliating to go knock door to door. So when it comes to embarrassment, the almana is 
gets the first dibs. She's going to get the money, so she doesn't have to go. He doesn't want to humiliate his wife to go knocking on doors. But when it's a matter of having extra money, he'd rather his daughter has more money. Okay, so that all explains against Rav Shesha, that you can't prove it from the widow because when it comes to having, whether her salary goes to her or to the sons, you can't prove it from there. The widow, it goes to the sons, but not necessarily for the daughter. Second question, Matif Rav Yosef against Rav Shesha. Again, Rav Shesha says the salary goes to the sons. Now we're going to disprove it from our Mishnah. What it said, her salary and something she finds on the on the ground, let's say, she finds somewhere. Even if she hasn't yet collected it, if she worked, let's forget her mitzia, we're going to explain that in a minute, it doesn't really make sense. But if she worked before the father died, then the father died, then she got paid her salary, what did the Mishnah say? The brothers get it because it was ready, theoretically hers. She already made the money before he died, even though it wasn't in her hands. The only reason was because she worked when the father was still alive. If it was after the father's death, then my love, right? Then la'atzma. It sounds like, but if she had worked after the father died and got paid her salary, it would go to herself. That's a clear inference from the Mishnah. And my, now you have to explain, it must be my love, Benizonet. It must be where they're sustaining her and she doesn't have to give them Masaya down. So to which Rav Shesha will answer, no, Nizonet. No, it must be a case where she wasn't getting fed by them and that's why she keeps her salary. So the Gemara says, no way, no how. If she's not getting fed, of course she could keep the money. What would this be teaching you? Even the one who says, There is this case where a master can say to his slave, you work for me and I'm not giving you food, but he can only do that. Because it doesn't say the word with you. Okay, I'm not going to get into the psukim here, but you can look them up. There by the Eved Ivri, there's a difference between a Jewish slave and a, and a Gentile slave. A Jewish slave, it says in the Pasuk Imach, that he's with you. That means you have to feed him. With the Gentile slave, it doesn't say you have to feed him. So theoretically, you could, generally, they didn't do this, but you could say, work for me and I'm not going to pay. But when it comes to a Jewish slave, lo, you can't say I'm not going to feed them. So what does that have to do with our case? Well, kol came bito. If you're a Jewish slave, you can't say, work for me and I'm not going to pay you. Well, then... I'm not going to feed you. You certainly can't say that to your daughter, right? Give me your salary and I'm not going to pay and I'm not going to feed you. So that means that obviously she's getting fed by them because there's no way they wouldn't be feeding her. So therefore, the Mishnah seems to clearly say they're feeding her and yet she doesn't have to give them the Masei Adayim if she works after the father's dead. So that's a clear proof against Rav Shesha. To which Rabbi Bar-Ula says, no, 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 you didn't understand the Mishnah. What they were talking here is the extra. Let's say she works for 100 shekel a day, and it costs them to feed her 100 shekel a day. So that's the classic case. So she gives them the money, she gets food. But if, or let's say she works for less, so she'll give them 80 and she'll get paid 100. Let's say she get, makes 110 shekels. So if it's her father, he gets the extra, the extra 10. If it's the brothers, they get, and this is Rav Shesha, they get her Masei Adayim, her 100, but they don't get the 10. That's the Chidoshia. But here, if the father died after she already did the 110 shekels worth of work, then the extra 10 goes to the brothers. If not, the extra 10 doesn't go to the brothers, okay? If he died before she worked. So now, the Gemara likes this answer so much, that Amarava, what did Rav Yosef not know that there was this halacha of hadafa that goes to the father and not to the brothers? And therefore, it's a clear explanation of the Mishnah. Why didn't he explain the Mishnah that way? So now they're wondering why Rav Yosef even asked the question. To which the Gemara said, uh, Rava himself answers, El Amarava, Rav Yosef, and now he's going to finally resolve this difficulty of the, the lost item in the Mishnah that seems very strange. Rav Yosef, Manitin Gufa Kashele. The Mishnah itself was very difficult for him to understand. Dikatanima Seyada Umitsiata said, right, her hand, whatever she works, her salary, and lost items that she finds. Apa Pisha Logavtai, even though she didn't collect them yet. So now, right, then again, if his father died before she collected them, 
mitziatam iman gavya. Who's she collecting the lost item from? If I find the lost item, I pick it up. If I don't pick it up, it's not mine. I don't own it at all. So who's she collect? There's no collection of lost items. Elalav hachikamar must mean maseya deha kit mitziata. Her salary is like things she finds. Now, what do we know about this? Ma mitziata b'chaya avlav. Now, if you find a lost item on the street and you're a minor, that's all going to go straight to your father. But but if your father's dead, Latsma, the only right, you're not going to get the brothers are not going to get those lost items. Those belong to the woman herself. The brothers don't fully take the place of the father. And then he reads the Mishnah as, oh, Maseyada is listed right next to the Mitziah to teach you. And that's Rav Yosef's proof, basically, that Rav Sheshit is wrong. And then Maseyadeha are like a mitziah, just like a mitziah doesn't go to the brothers. Maseyadeha doesn't go to the brothers unless, as the Mishnah said, she didn't collect it, right? The, she worked first, then the father died, then she collected. Then it'll go to the brothers, otherwise it doesn't go to the brothers at all. So that's Rav Yosef's position against Rav Sheshit. Eat Barnami, and in fact, it said, I'm a Rav Yehud, I'm a Rav. Rav Yehud is the name of Rav. Even though she gets money from the brothers to eat. She keeps her Maseyadeh. I'm a Rav Kahana, my time. He says, what's the reason? It says, you, you pass on, this is talking about Avadim, Kananim, Canaanite slaves. They're passed down to your sons after you. Otam libnechem, they darch him here now. Just those go to your sons. But the rights of your daughters do not go to your sons. From here you learn that all the skuyot that a father has to the daughter do not go to them, do not go to the sons. So when the father dies, the daughter's stuff becomes her own. Okay, now, this matrifla rabba, okay, that goes in line with what Rav Yosef had said against Rav Sheshen. Comes Rabbi and he says, Maybe it's not talking about her salary. There's a difference between salary and extra payments, like if she was raped and she gets a knas, or like if she gets hurt by somebody, then it would go to her. But maybe her salary does go. And the, the things that they're talking about here are extras, right? That would normally go to the father, but not to her. He also brought a bride to the said, It's talking about if she was raped or seduced or well, right, any kind of penalty, but not pay, but not her salary. So, and that would support Rav Sheshet because then her salary still goes to the brothers. To which the Gemara says, what, what are you talking about? Chavalot? We have to find something that would normally go to the father, but instead goes to the brothers but, or won't go to the brothers. But now, if she gets injured, it goes straight to her. It doesn't go to her father. That's a payment that wouldn't go to her father. The knas, yes, right? The mafute, yes. But not uh, if someone punches you in the arm, that goes straight to you, not to your father, even if you're a minor, because that's her own body. To which Amar Rabbi Yossi Bar Hanina, moving out of Amabet, he explains, no, in certain cases it would. If she's injured in her face or any other place that would affect her value on the marketplace. Now, remember, the father has rights to sell his daughter as a maidservant, as difficult as that is to accept. In those days, that, that did happen. And that's an example for something, if it diminishes the value that affects the father, because he can't now sell her, that is something that theoretically you could say it's something the father has rights to, but the sons won't have rights to because the sons can't do that. So we have two ways of understanding this pasuk. One according to Yosef, that is referring also to salary, that the sons don't inherit the daughter's salary. And according to Rav Sheshed, it means the sons don't inherit any extra payments that might have gone to the father that now aren't going to go to the sons. Amar of Zera, Amar of Matna, Amar Rav, Rav Zera passed down the name of Matna and the name of Rav. And some people say, Amar of Amar Rabbi Zera, Amar of Matna, Amar Rav, whether Rabbi Zera became Rabbi Zera when he moved to Israel and got Smicha in Israel, because Smicha was only given in Israel. So it's a matter of, was he still in Babylonia or was it after he got to Israel? In either case, they passed down in the name of Rav, Bat Hanizonet Min Achim Maaseya Dehalatzma. Here we saw before also Rav said this, that if she's getting sustenance from the brothers, she still gets to keep her salary. Dichtiv, as it says, this is just a review. It's just other people passing down the halacha in the name of Rav. Right? 
You get the slaves, the Canaanite slaves, but you don't get your daughter's salaries, okay? Your sister's salaries, really. So a person doesn't pass on the rights to his daughters, right? All the rights he had to his daughter's stuff, he doesn't pass that on to his son. Okay, when Rabbi Zeres said this, and maybe this is why, because they want to, they mentioned this, even though we already know Rabbi said this. Well, there was a response. Rabbi Vimi Bar Papi says, Shakud Amaha. He said, Shakud said this. Okay, Shakdan is someone who usually is a very serious person. Anyway, they say, Shakud Manu, Shmuel, Harav Amara. They say, well, Shakud is Shmuel, not Rav, but didn't Rav say it? So, Ema Af Shakud Amara. When he said Shakud Amara, what he wanted to say is, not only does Rav say this, like you said, but also Shmuel agrees with this. So now we have Rav, Shmuel, and Rav Yosef all saying this against Rav Shesha. Amar Bar Amemar, the Rav Ashi going now, skipping a few generations. We now get to Rav, Rav Ashi's generation. Mar Bar Amemar says to him, Hachi Amar Nahardia, Nahardia, they said, Hilchot HaKavate to Rav Shesha, that the brothers do inherit the salary. Sorry, they do get the rights to the salary of the sister. Rav Ashi Amar, Hilchta Kavate de Rav, Rav Ashi, Hal like Rav, the Hilchta Kavate de Rav. And in fact, the Halacha is like Rav. Okay, new Mishnah. Hamares et Bito. It's a little bit confusing Mishnah. We're going to deal with it in the Gemara as we go on. Okay, so Hamares et Bito Vigirsha, Irsa Vinit Armela, Tubata Shelo. If you betroth your daughter and then she gets divorced from the betrothal, she hasn't yet been married, then you again. She gets um, engaged, and then this time, divorce, but the husband dies. Ketubata shelo, fascinating. The ketuba goes to the father because she never got married. She never left the domain of her father. So she's still in the domain of her father, and she gets the ketuba. Now, what ketuba? Ketuba, we usually get from marriage, not from erusim. So Rashi points out here on the third line in Rashi, once the Mishnah starts, Kasaval Gesh Arusa. There's actually a debate about it. Is Narusa worthy of already of getting a tuba from the time of the engagement? Does she get a tuba? And number two, he points out the Bimena Arut Uktanut Kamar. It's obviously talking about when she's still in Arakhtana. If she was a Bogeret, she'd be in her own domain already, wouldn't go to the father. And the Eri says, no, tuba is not at the time of Erusin, but but the we're talking about a case where he decided anyway to give her to, even though he didn't need to do it till the wedding. He took care of it early. He gave it to her and then ended up breaking the, the betrothal or dying. Okay. And then that tuba will go to the father. So there's a debate about what exactly the case is here. He see Ave Gersham, back to the Mishnah, if he married her and then divorced her, or he see Ave Nit Armala, or he married her and then she got widowed. I'm sorry. And Two, there were two marriages here. She married them, got divorced, and then she married and the husband died. Ketuba Tashela. Since she was already married, she gets the ketuba herself, okay? Once she's married, the ketuba becomes hers, even in the first marriage, and obviously in the second. Rabbi Yehuda disagrees and says, Harishona Shela. No. Even for marriage, the first ketuba actually goes to the hus- to the father. You might find this very surprising. I'm sure you all think that your ketubah is yours. And the truth is your ketubah is yours. Because remember, Rashi says this is only if she's betrothed under the age of under the age of 12 and six months. I imagine all of you were married or betrothed at a later age. So this is not an issue. But if you were betrothed that young, then the ketubah will go to the fine. Um, they said to him, Mishi siya in la via reshupa. No way, no how. Once she's married, the rabbis say, She's out of her father's domain. He does not get the ketuba. So we're going to have to wait to the Gemara to see what's Rabbi Yehuda's approach. So first the Gemara says, first they point out an interesting thing, which is notice both cases started with divorce with the first husband, death with the second. So they want to point out, why didn't they say, if theoretically it would be the same whether both divorced her or both died. So Tama di Siava Gersha, he Siava Nidarmala, specifically says he married her, then divorced, married, and then she got uh, widowed. Right. Why didn't it say she was widowed twice? Because if she was, she wouldn't be able to get remarried again. This is a whole different halacha entirely. And because the mission didn't use that case, and Rashi points out, because that would be a poor anut, the mission didn't want to talk about a terrible, tragic case. And they, they, by not telling you this terrible, tragic case, they want to teach you this halacha that the Mishnah underhandedly kind of tells you that they hold like Rebbe. There's a big debate, Rebbe and Rashbag, when it comes to Chazaka. How many times does it take to create a Chazaka? 
two or three. And this comes up in a bunch of different sugyot. Comes up by short tam, short muab, which we just discussed. Is two times or three times. It comes up by um, veset, like when you want to know, do you have a regular period in terms of knowing what days you're expecting to get your period and you're supposed to separate from your husband? So is it two or is it three? Like if you see exactly at the same distance, right? Every month, 30 days, and you've seen twice, right? With a 30 day interval, is that enough? Or do you need an interval of 30 days, three times? So generally we hope three, but in this issue, and partially because of this Mishnah, or at least the Gemara is saying here, the Mishnah seems to go like Rabbi Damar betrays the Nehavi Chazaka. And this woman is called the Nishat Katlanit because she kills husbands. Okay. Now, not that she actually kills them, but there's a suspicion that, right, there's a, they're worried that this woman shouldn't marry a third time because she might cause the death of her next husband. So, but the fact that the Mishnah didn't say that, so that would be a horrible case because then she wouldn't be able to get married again. They didn't want to mention a horrible case, so they mentioned one where there was divorce and then and then widow. Obviously, you could have said Nidgarsha twice. Okay. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Harishana shall up. So now we want to understand Rabbi Yehuda. My time is Rabbi Yehuda. What's his reason? So Rabbi of Rabbi Yosef, the Amri Travai, they try to explain. Because already from the time of the betrothal, the father has rights to the money of the ketubah. Now, even though maybe we don't write the ketubah at the erisin, but once you've betrothed someone, there's an obvious, right, you're going to give her a ketubah. And in fact, if you don't write a ketubah, she has rights to the ketubah, and that really starts from erisin. So he says, from the time of erisin, already he was supposed to have written the ketubah, or theoretically could have, right? He's committing to her, and the father's in charge at that point, so the father gets it even though she eventually gets married and she's on her own. Mati Rabba, Rabba says, what are you talking about? I'm going to show you a different source that seems to contradict. Rabbi Yehuda, Rishona shall af. Umode Rabbi Yehuda, Bemare Sepitok, Shiktana, Ubagra, Vacharkach Nisei, Che'en Lavi Arishupa. Doesn't start from the moment of the Arishim, because Rabbi Yehuda says that if he betrothes her when she's a minor, then she becomes of age, okay, 12 two simanim, and then six months. She becomes a bogeret. Then she gets married. En la via reshupa. He doesn't have rights to the ketubah in that case. So what do you see? It's not from the beginning of the erusim. So am I. Hachinami le maho ilu mishat erusim zachab emaad. If you say, from the moment of erusim, he has rights to it, then even if she became a bogeret in the middle, shouldn't affect things. And it does, obviously, according to him. So, so therefore, we have to change what Rabbi Rabbi Yosef said in light of this other source about Rabbi Yehuda. They say it doesn't go by the time of the Eusim, but it goes by the time of when it was written. And the assumption is it must have been written sometime before the marriage. And therefore it goes by whether if she was a Bulgarian then, then no. If she wasn't a Bulgarian, which is what our mission was talking about, then when the tuba was written, then it goes to the father. Now the Gemara asks the question, Okay. Rashi explains this question as having a little bit kind of veering off the topic, although connected to the issue of collecting ketuba. Um, Tosfot has issue with that because then what is it doing here? And Tosfot has a whole different reading here, but we're going to go with Rashi. Rashi says, now here you have to understand some basics, which is a ketuba is something that the woman has rights to get when the husband divorces her or dies. And it's such an important thing that I told you before, even if she doesn't write it, called a tenai beti, in the condition of the court, even if he doesn't write her a ketubah, she has one anyway. She gets the 200 zoos, no matter what. Again, if she's a virgin, if not 100. And in addition, she can demand it from land that he sold from the time of, and now this is a big question, from the time of what? From the time of the engagement, from the time of the wedding, from the time of the writing of the ketubah, from when, okay, any land he sells from time X, which we don't know what X is, any land he sells from then, she can go demand, let's say he has no money left and no house left and no field or anything. She can go take that field that he sold, demand it back for her ketubah from Joe Schmo that he sold it. Okay, so from when? From the time of the betrothal, from the time of the wedding, from when does it kick in? Amaravuna, it says, manamatayim, the basic amount of the ketubah. Okay, you might notice that a lot of ketubahs have a basic amount and a tosefet, an additional amount. The basic amount is 100 for the wit for the non-virgin and 200 for the virgin. So that basic amount, mina erusim, from the time of the betrothal. 
בתוספת, מן הנישואין, any additional though is from the marriage or from when the כתוב is written. ורב אסי אמר, איך את זה ואיך את זה מן הנישואין. רב אסי says, no, no, no. When he writes the כתוב, she basically gives up her rights to any, right, any commitment from before. And basically, at the time it's written, she basically says, okay, since there's a date on this כתוב, I'm going to agree that I'll only get it from land yourself from here on in. Okay, that's Rav Asi. What's going to interest us right now is Rav Huna. Rav Huna says we're going to differentiate between the amount of the ketuba and, uh, the base and the of the base and the extra. Extra is only what's written in the ketuba, so that's going to be from the day of the ketuba. But the original, that basically from the time he's betrothed her, he's committing that, even though he didn't write it yet, that is from the time of the engagement. So Umar is going to ask, Rav Huna hachi? did he really say this? Here's a weird case. He dies, let's say, or he's di- divorces her. She pulls out two ketubas, okay? One said 200, one said 300. So Rapuna says, I'm a Rapuna. Now, the ketuba of the 200 was written earlier, okay? Let's say in 2021, that one was written. Then, right, from the time of the betrothal or around early on in the betrothal, the 300 one was written at the time of the wedding, a year later. Often it was a year, so 2022. So now, if she pulls out the 200 one and says, I want to collect this one, she could collect it from all the land he sold in the year 2021 or beyond. If she goes to get the one and says, I want to get more money, but what the, what's the issue? But she can only collect it from land he sold in 2022. Okay? Now, if what Rav Huna said was really true, that let's say she had a ketuba for 300, what's that made up of? It's 200 of the base and 100 of the extra. So she should be able to, she should be at least allowed to get 200, if she pulls out the 300 ketuba and wants to use that one, in a minute we'll talk about why she has two ketubas. If she pulls out the 300 one, 300 one is made up of 200 plus 100. So the 200 is the basic, that she should be able to collect from the Arisin according to what he said. And the extra hundred, that only from the time of the date on the ketuba. To which they answer back for Rav Huna, according to what you're saying, what do you mean? She has a 200 and a 300. She should collect all 500. She should say, oh, look, you gave me two ketubas. It's all together. It's not either or. So, matayim is man rishon and tlat me'am is man shenit. She should get 200 from the date of the first one and 300 from the date of the second one. Why not? Because again, what actually is happening in this case? It must be. Now, normally in a ketuba, if you look at your ketuba and you have a tosefet in your ketuba, what it says is, I'm giving you this money and an additional. But this one obviously didn't say an additional. Okay? Didn't say that. So now, the reason you're not collecting chamesh mail is because kevandelo katavla tzvitivo sepatlach tlat mea matayim. It doesn't say in the 301. This ketuba is in addition to the 200, and I'm giving you 300 extra. It must be that hachi ka'amrele, this must be what he was saying to her. Im is mam rishon, he's basically giving her two ketubas and giving her a choice. Probably he sold a lot of land in 2021 and didn't really want her collecting from that land. So he said to her like this, 200, right? If you want to collect, im is mam rishon gavit, if you want to collect from the beginning of 2021, land that I sold, gavia matayim, then you can collect this 200 ketuba. But Imi's Manchani got it. He makes a business deal with her. He says, listen, I'll give you 300 if you decide that you're only going to, you can get the 300, but Gavya, right? Imi's Manchani Gavya, Gavya Tlatmea. If you wait and you only, and it's when you collect in 2035 or whatever it is, but you're only going to collect money from land I sold from 2022, then you can get more money. So he's basically giving her this option of where can you get, right? And that's why this is a unique case and it has no reflection on regular cases. So hachanami, I'm going on to the next stuff because we're kind of really mid-sentence. Likewise, when you look, so that's how you look at the 200 and 300 together. It's it's an either or. So he says, and that's all because you didn't write in the 300, it's 200 plus, right? That you didn't write in the 300, I'm giving you 300 in addition to the 200. So comes Rav Hune, and now he explains, Hachanami, likewise, if you look at just this 300 ketuba alone, you tried to question me and say the 300 is really 200 plus 100. Why can't you collect the 200 from the earlier day? Well, Hainu Tama Delo Gavya, Midelo Katavla Usipa Lachme Amatayim. 
It's because in this 300, not only did it not say I'm giving you the 300 in addition to the 200, it also didn't say I'm giving you a 200 as base and another 100. And therefore, it must be a hula achilte l'shibuda kama. It must be that her, when she agreed to take this 300 tuba, was a unique tuba that he's basically saying, take this or that, okay? And, right, she was basically giving up on her early, right, her option to take, to split this 200 and 100. That's why he made this business deal with her. And that's why she can't collect the 200 from the earlier date, because this was a deal that he made with her. You're going to either collect this one or this one. It's not viewed as a regular ktuba, but in a normal ktuba, where it says 200 plus 100, we do split the 200 and 100, because we view the 200 goes from the earlier date and the 100 goes from the, the date it was written. So again, we have this debate between Rav Huna and Rav Asi. Rav Asi says the whole thing can only be collected from the date of the ktuba. Rav Huna thinks, no, 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 the base is already committed from the Erusin, even if he didn't write it yet. It's still, it's a commitment of the husband to the wife. That's basic and, and clear. So she can demand it for money he sold from the date of the engagement, even though it was only written possibly a year later. But the extra money, that can only come from the time it was written because obviously in the time of the Erusin, nobody needs to give extra. So if they give extra, it's going to be from the, that date. Okay, that's it for today. We will continue uh, in tomorrow's Sibya. Have a great day, everyone.